Great. Um, thank you for the invitation. Uh, this is based on a recent paper with Fernando Alde, as well as many previous papers with other authors, which I will mention throughout the talk. OK, so let's begin with a very general introduction. So quantum gravity. Um, as everybody knows, uh, gravity is non-normalizable. And so that means quantum corrections induce infinite higher derivative corrections to the Einstein-Hilbert action R. So if we write the action of gravity as follows in d bulk dimensions, where here we have LD, which is the d-dimensional Planck length, we have the leading term, which is the Einstein-Hilbert term, which you have to have in order for it to be gravity. But then you will have infinite higher derivative corrections where we write the first correction, for instance, an R squared term, and there will be infinitely more. Um, these corrections will have higher powers of the Planck length, and that's why you could think of this as a small Planck length expansion. And in all, uh, for a general, just based on effective field theory, we don't know what these coefficients of these corrections are. Um, so when we say that a we have a certain UV complete theory of quantum gravity, what that means is that this theory tells us how to fix all the coefficients of these higher derivative corrections, such as kappa, which is a very tall order because there's infinite corrections, and so this UV complete theory has to have you know, infinite information more than just classical Einstein gravity. So it's very difficult to do this. And so far, the only known such UV completions with massless particles of spin two or less are string theory in 10 dimensions and M theory in 11 dimensions. And of course, these two theories are related by duality. So we think there's really just one way of quantum completing um, gravity. The problem is that it's hard in practice to compute corrections. Uh, for string theory, and even in principle for M theory, because in the case of M theory, we don't even have a world sheet, which allows us to do perturbative injury string calculations. And so we have this in principle UV completion, but in practice, it's hard to actually get that much out of it. Um, so of course, uh, the classic answer to this dilemma is ADS CFT. So when you have quantum gravity on ADS, negative curvature, um, a solution is given by ADS CFT, uh, which is best understood in the maximally supersymmetric cases, uh, which I will list briefly. So for instance, you have M theory on ADS4 cross S7 is dual to 3D ABGM theory, which is CFT. You have type 2B string theory on ADS5 cross S5 is dual to N equals 4C per mills in 4D. And you have M theory on ADS7 cross S4 is dual to the 62 comma zero theory. So in this ADS-CFT correspondence, scattering of gravitons in ADS space in the bulk is dual to correlators of the stress tensor multiplet in the CFT. Um, and furthermore, you can actually recover flat space scattering, which is equivalent to the effective action given in the previous slide, using a precisely understood flat space limit given by Penadonis in 2010, also based on many works by previous authors. So uh, this graphic kind of shows sorry. what's going on. Yes? Sorry to draw. Can I have a quick question? So sure. would you say that uh, using this flat space limit, you can use ADCFT to provide a non-perturbative definition of any scattering amplitude of let's say I don't I don't I don't think this is, I, you know, I I don't think this flat space limit is is works for every possible amplitude I'm told okay. like there could be weird cases of maybe higher point functions where there be subtleties but you know for the simplest vanilla case you know four point function in these standard examples it works just fine okay but but um, yeah 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 but, but indeed I think it's a very interesting question to see to what extent this flat space limit formula can be generalized to other cases yeah I think it's a fascinating question and I would love to hear more about it yeah, thank you. um uh, okay, uh, so um, the picture is here. Basically, you have scattering in a cylinder, and in the flat, which is ADS, and then as you take the flat space limit, it just becomes flat scattering in flat space, i.e., the effective action. Um, okay, uh, so now let's talk about the question of scale separation. So, in all known cases of ADS CFT, the radius of the compact space time, for instance, the S5 in the ADS5 cross S5 case, is the same as the ADS radius. So another way of saying this is that these extra dimensions of the compact space are large. And this makes these examples very unphysical, as we expect possible extra dimensions in our actual universe to be very small. Now, of course, you might say ADS-CFT in the first place is unphysical, because we don't live in ADS space. But this is yet an extra unphysicality in that not only is it ADS, but in fact, the compact space is also very big. Um, and so that's why when people say like, oh, ADS-CFT is supposed to be bulk theory in D plus one dimensions dual to CFT in D dimensions, that's not totally true because like, because the radius of both the compact and non-compact space are the same, you're really looking at like the 10 full dimensions in string theory, you know, dual to the CFT in four dimensions. Um, and so the question is, is there a UV complete theory of quantum gravity uh, with small extra dimensions in the context of ADS CFT or in general? 
which of course is a question which people in Swampland are very interested in. So in this talk, I will show that pure ADS supergravity, which I define basically as a theory of quantum gravity and ADS with no compact space-time factor, saturates the most general conformal bootstrap bounds on ADS graviton scattering uh, in a small Planck-Lanx expansion at one loop. Um, so uh, this will be the hard evidence we show, uh, but this hard evidence will suggest a speculation, a possibility that these non-perturbative bootstrap bounds, which in principle work at any loop order, could in fact define pure supergravity non-perturbatively, i.e. they could fix all coefficients in the higher derivative correction of Einstein-Hilbert and thus give a putative scale-separated consistent theory of quantum gravity. So that is the main point of this talk. Uh, before I move on to the outline, if there's any preliminary questions. Could I, could, can I just ask, um, Sure. Is, is there an easy way of seeing the extra dimensions from the CFT? The fact that there are extra dimensions? Yes, yeah, there is, and that will be discussed in detail. But yeah, excellent question. In, indeed, th that's how we're able to do the calculation. Um, great. Uh, any other questions? Yeah, could I ask, Shai, could you could sure. do that? Because you're saying that you're saturated the bounds. You're, you're, you're going to show us that you saturate the bounds. Yeah. Could it be that then uh, it goes the other way around that actually uh, even time a, a minute improvement on the bounds can actually show that these pure supergravity is in the swamp plan? Could that well, let, let, let's wait till we still wait till we see the bounds. These are all excellent questions, but um, okay. let, let, let's see the bounds then, then we can discuss. Um, okay, so uh, yes, when you say hard evidence, this involves some extrapolation, right? Uh, well, no, at one loop, uh, I wouldn't say it involves an extrapolation. I mean, like beyond one loop, of course, it's very speculative. Um, but the one loop I, I think is pretty good. The numerics uh, are done at finite C or strictly infinite C? Well, the numerics are done at finite C. Um, yeah, you could also say, okay, look, these are all great questions. Let's just wait till we see the plot. Yeah, indeed, you could say like, what part of the plot counts as large C, what counts as finite C? And you know, of course, yes. you know, that's kind of an artistic question. Um, but you know, the hard part is the one loop calculation. Um, the, the extent to which it matches is uh, for you guys to decide. Hopefully, I will convince you. Um, yeah, but let, let's wait till we see the um, okay, so any further questions? Um, good. Okay, so in that case, so the outline will be, first we're going to discuss kinematics of the stress sensor correlator in maximally supersymmetric CFTs in the max Susie cases, which is G equals 3, 4, and 6. Uh, then we're going to discuss the small Planck-like expansion of holographic correlators for the various gravity duals. Then we're going to discuss how to get one loop from tree level. And then finally, we'll give the numerical bootstrap results for the various cases and the relation to the bulk duals. So let's start off, start off with some standard uh, kinematics. Uh, so consider a four-point function of the stress tensor multiplet, where in particular we, we can look at the superprimary, which is a scalar of dimension d minus two, uh, where again, d can be three, four, and six, and we're going to suppress all our symmetry dependence for simplicity. So we take the four-point function of this scalar, and as usual, we use conformal symmetry to write it in terms of this function of g and u and v, uh, where u and v are conformal cross ratios. So g and u and v is the quantity of interest. Uh, furthermore, we can explain this G of U and V in super blocks worked out by these authors for each super multiplet, which appears in this four point function. Um, so then in this expression, we have OP coefficients, lambda, for each super multiplet, as well as scaling dimensions in the case that the super multiplet is unprotected. Um, so on general grounds, because these are unitary CFTs, the OP coefficient squared must be positive. And lastly, we have crossing symmetry, which basically comes from the fact that for this Euclidean four-point function, you can rearrange the operators. And this gives this you know, non-perturbative infinite set of constraints called the crossing equations, which as people are probably familiar with by now, is where the bootstrap comes from. Um, and so this is a very short one-page summary of uh, the four-point function we care about. Uh, now let's talk about how this four-point function can be interpreted when we take C to be large. So first of all, what is C? So C is the coefficient of the stress tensor two-point function in a canonical normalization. Um, and so, so the reason why C is useful is first of all, um, conformal unwarranted entities fix C to be inversely proportional to the OP coefficient of the stress tensor. And that means that it's a quantity we can input into the bootstrap just kinematically in general. So we don't have to make any assumptions about the theory. Every single CFT has C as long as it's the local CFT and we can just put it in. Um, from the more physical perspective, though, the reason we care about C is that it counts the degrees of freedom in the theory. So for instance, for n equals four super ring mills with n colors, C goes like n squared. In ABGM, it will go like n to the three halves. And the 6D theory will go like n cubed, uh, where we actually know the precise formula. I'm just showing you, you know, the rough scale. Um, and so we have this parameter we can put in to the bootstrap, which basically tells us the value of n um, for the theory of interest. 
Um, now, if we want to relate this to the bulk, um, so for a bulk uh, theory with bulk dimension capital D, um, just based on dimensional analysis, C is proportional to the ratio of the two dimensional parameters, which is LADS and the Planck length, to the power D minus two, where you have D minus two basically because you know, one over C is what's multiplying the Einstein-Hilbert term. Einstein-Hilbert term has length dimension two, and the full thing is length dimension D, so you get D minus two. And so this means when the Planck length is small, C is big. And so in our bootstrap analysis, we're going to be looking at large C in order to study small Planck. So if the bulk is Einstein gravity in the small Planck length expansion, i.e. no higher spins, then the one over C expansion is severely restricted as shown famously by Ristelli and Zhao in their classic analytic bootstrap paper. So they consider the following constraints, crossing symmetry, supersymmetry, and analyticity which is um, basically a way of saying that you can only have certain Witten diagrams at each order in one over C. So with these three simple constraints, quite general, uh, they were able to show that the four-point function as written in terms of G and U and V has the following expansion. And so this is a totally general expansion, which I'm showing for general space-time dimension D. And the only assumption is that you don't have massless higher spins. So I'm not, I'm not assuming string theory or M theory or anything. Um, just, just, just maximal supersymmetry, crossing symmetry, and you know Einstein gravity. Um, so let, let's explain this expansion. So the first term is a disconnected term. It's a bit trivial. The, the next term is GR of C is the Einstein-Hilbert term, goes like one over C. Then you have higher loop corrections. For instance, um, a one loop Witten diagram with two supergravity vertices will now go like C to the minus two, where there's a certain contact term ambiguity, which I write here with this coefficient kappa. So that's the first line. The first line is showing one loop corrections. Um, the, the second and third line is showing higher derivative corrections, um, where these weird powers of C just come from dimensional analysis. Because remember from the previous slide that C is related to a certain power of Planck length, and these higher derivative corrections scale with Planck length, and so they will have these powers of C depending on the value of D. So the first higher derivative correction is what we call R to the 4, which is a contraction of four Riemann tensors. Then you have D to the 4 R to the 4, which is you act with covariant derivatives, et cetera. D to the 6 R to the 4, D to the 8 R to the 4. These are the guys allowed by supersymmetry for the, for the stress tensor four part function. Of course, in the most general effective action, you could have other higher derivative corrections, but they just won't contribute specifically to the four point function. Um, so I will discuss in more detail in a few slides, but as shown by Eric, Ofer, Fernando, and Agnesa, in fact, there is a method to compute higher loop terms from lower loop terms up to contact term ambiguities. Um, and so that will be one of the main tools we use in this talk. Um, also, you might ask a question. I only have one expansion parameter here, C, which is dual just to the Planck length expansion. So this is this is a little bit different, say from like other string theory oh, expansions you'll see where there's two parameters. Um, sorry. Um, so usually, you know, if you, you're hearing a talk on type two B string theory, there'll be an expansion in the string coupling and the string length. Here I just have the string length, and so from the string theory perspective, it's as if string coupling is finite because I'm I'm only expanding in the in the string length, i.e. the Planck length, i.e. the dimension full parameter. And so because there's just one parameter we're expanding in, that means in principle, at very high order, there will be no difference between tree level terms and loop terms. Because if they have the same power of C, you can't distinguish between them. Nonetheless, at low order, coincidentally, they just have different powers. So at low order, you know, the loop corrections will have integer powers of C, whereas the tree level guys will have fractional powers. And so you will be able to tell the difference. Um, and uh, furthermore, these tree terms only contribute to a finite set of CFT data, i.e. that for low spin, as shown in this classic paper. Um, so any questions about this general expansion before we move on? Um, is this, is this, sorry, is this assuming maximal Susie or? Yes, yeah, yes, yes. So this is assuming maximal supersymmetry. Mm -hmm. Thank you. C can, I, can, I, can I ask, Shai? So, so the, sure. the, 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 the punchline that I thought I understood from these, the last paper you said, the one by Hemsdurk and, and all this, is that at tree level, like I can certainly write down any effective theory Lagrangian and at leading order, uh, in one over C is going to satisfy crossing symmetry. And now you're telling us that that is true, but quantum when, when there's quantum effects, there might be constraints. Is, is that right? Well, yeah, yeah. Basically, I mean, what Rastelli and Zhao was in a sense kind of like, you know, it was very related to this original paper by Heemsworth, Penadonis, Polchinski, and Sully. I mean, like you, from the modern perspective, you look at, you could look at both papers as basically saying that general constraints of analyticity crossing and supersymmetry just fix you know, the possible terms you can write down in a small Planck length expansion. So like that, that's the story in general. Okay. Um, and so like a detail of that story is that some of those terms in the effective action only contribute to a finite number of spins. 
what you what you could call contact terms. Okay. This is in contrast to exchange terms like this GR over C, which contribute to all spin data. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Um, okay, great. So, so let's give an application of this formula to the case where the bulk dimension is 11, i.e. for M theory. And we can consider the specific case of M theory and ADS4 cross S7 where it's dual to 3D ABJF. So if we just plug in D equals 11 into the previous slides formula, we now get this explicit expansion where again, we have tree level supergravity, R to the four, D to the four, R to the four, et cetera, as well as some loop terms. This loop term here on the first line is two supergravity vertices. And on the bottom line, we show a loop term with one supergravity and one R to the four vertex. And we have these precise weird fractions of C. Um, so M theory is uh, supposedly UV complete theory of quantum gravity. So in principle, all these coefficients kappa and B, which you see here, all of them should be fixed by M theory. But that's a very hard calculation. In principle, you would have to, first of all, know the M theory effective action to all order and then do dimensional reduction. So in practice, the way we have been trying to fix these coefficients so far is using localization in the ABGM theory. And for, for, for that method, we have so far only been able to compute the coefficients of the higher derivative corrections up to D to the four, R to the four in these various papers. And so the first higher derivative correction, which is unprotected by supersymmetry is D to the eight, R to the four. And we do not expect to be able to fix that just using supersymmetric localization. The intuition being that you can't get unprotected data from a protected input. And so for that, we will need some other constraints like perhaps the numerical bootstrap. Um, but I just want to emphasize that this is just trying to fix stuff from the CFT. Like, you know, in principle, if you knew everything about M theory, all these terms should be fixed, you know, because that has to be the case for a UV complete theory of quantum graph. Um, so in particular, the first term, first unprotected term we would want to fix is this C to the minus 23 over nine term, which might be zero. That's what some people call. Um, so now let's give a different example, also AD is four, but now with the bulk dimension is four, i.e. there's no compact factor. So this is what we would call pure supergravity in ADS4. So this will have a different expansion now because capital D is four. So you have a disconnected term, you have a tree level term, and you have these one loop terms. These have, those are the same scaling as before, except now the first higher derivative correction, R to the four, is going to show up at C to the minus four. So you see that when the bulk dimension is smaller, that means that these higher derivative corrections are much more suppressed. And so in this case, it shows up only at C to the minus four, which coincidentally is the same scaling as the four loop supergravity term. Um, uh, so not only is the scaling similar to the ADS4 cross the seven case, but even these precise G coefficients, which are certain functions of U and V are completely identical at up to tree level supergravity. So this guy and the disconnected term, um, this is basically because tree level supergravity doesn't care whether or not you have a compact factor. And so it only starts becoming different once you go to one loop, i.e. this GRR term. And this is why if you want to distinguish between pure supergravity and any kind of compact factor dual to M theory, you have to go beyond tree level supergravity. You have to go to one loop or higher derivative corrections because otherwise you just don't see a difference. Um, and that, that's why one loop is so crucial to this story. Um, so yeah, that's a very important point I really want to emphasize is that you know, you know, it would, life would have been easy if you could just look at tree level supergravity and tell the difference, but you can't. I mean, another way of saying that is tree level supergravity is a consistent truncation. So like it just doesn't care about all the KK modes. Um, okay, so because one loop is so important, let's discuss in detail how you compute one loop, uh, starting with this classic paper by uh, these authors. Um, I'll explain it from a slightly more modern uh, formalism, i.e. the Lorentzian inversion formula. So that inversion formula tells you that the four-point function of G and U and V uh, can be computed in terms of its double discontinuity, what we call the DD, which is basically if you have some kind of divergence in the V goes to one limit. Um, now, it fixes this four-point function up to contact terms that contribute only to CFD data of low spin. So that's an important calculus. Um, so how does this work in practice? Let's take our four-point function of G and U and V. Let's expand to one loop, i.e. one over C squared. And if we just take the block expansion and just you know, kinematically expand it, we will find the following term as well as other terms. So there'll be a term that looks like log squared U um, times this uh, super block for a multiple at M. Um, and then I'm showing the contributions from unprotected double trace operators, which I label by their spin L, which has to be even, as well as their twist 2N. Uh, well, it's actually 2D minus 2 plus 2N, but, but, but labeled by N. Um, and so what's the specific CFT data that's showing up in one loop? So we have these uh, OP coefficients just from the C goes infinity limit, so generalized free field theory. And then we have a square of the anomalous dimensions of these unprotected operators at tree level. 
So you see though, even though we're at one loop order, specifically this log squared u term is only multiplying data from previous orders, i.e. tree level and, and the disconnected order. Um, now, the other terms at one loop order, of course, will depend on one loop data, but specifically this term does not depend on one loop data. And that's, and that's why this whole method works because after you do crossing, which basically makes u go to v, this is going to be the log squared v term. And this is going to be the only term at one loop order which contributes to the double discontinuity. And so because this is the only term that contributes to the double discontinuity, and because it's written in terms of tree level data, that is why you can compute one loop from tree level. And so this is one way of explaining the results from the paper at the top of the slide. Um, um, sorry, Shai, can I ask yes. you, just to clarify, like uh, uh, the formula that you write down is the formula for the one loop contribution. Yeah. Um, but I mean, you're emphasizing a lot that it's amazing that you can compute the one loop term from the tree level terms, but isn't this like the usual thing? Like, you know, if you give me an effective action at tree level, I follow Feynman rules or, you know, write down within diagrams in ADS and I should be able to compute the one loop. Sure. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Look, look, it's just how to do it in practice. I mean, like, you know, okay. principle, maybe it's expected you could do that. So oh, okay, okay. Surprised okay. Conceptually, it's just, you know, very hard calculations to do in practice. That's why people only figured out how to do it, you know, six years ago. Okay. Um, uh, and this is, of course, up to contact terms, you know, because if you just wrote down Feynman diagrams, you know, you want to know contact terms. Uh, so, yeah, so, so here I'm just trying to tell you how this thing works in practice, but it, it shouldn't surprise anybody. Um, um, so, but there's a certain subtlety. So when I said you could get one loop from tree level, um, uh, if you know this tree level data of these double trace operators uh, labeled by N and L, so the subtlety is that double trace operators are degenerate at leading order. So let's unpack them. So... Uh, imagine you're looking at a certain bulk theory on ADS cross some compact factor. So this is going to have KK modes from compactifying in, say, 10 or 11 dimensions. Um, and so these KK modes, according to ADS CFT, are dual to single trace operators in the CFT. We label these by SP for P greater than or equal to 2, such that P equal 2 is the stress tensor. This is the super primary, so it's a scalar. And the dimension of these guys in general is P times D minus 2 over 2. It's because it's just P times the dimension of a free operator, free scalar. So if the compact factor in the bulk is a sphere, so say 80 is 4 across to 7, then we have KK modes for all P, as you would expect. If the bulk also has a Z2 orbifold, which also preserves maximal supersymmetry, then you only have KK modes of even P. And then there's a third possibility which preserves supersymmetry, which is that there's no compact factor at all. And then the only KK mode is just the graviton itself, P equals 2. So these are the three cases which kinematically preserve maximal supersymmetry. Um, now, whether or not they all correspond to physical theories, who knows? but at least this is what's allowed based on kinematics. So if we now want to construct double trace operators by contracting two of these single traces, SPSP, so we do it in the following way. We have the two single traces, and in between that, we put a bunch of derivatives. So L derivatives to get spin L, and then N boxes to add 2N. And that's how we get the dimension 2N plus L plus P times D minus 2. The problem, though, is that you can see that for different values of P and N, you, you will get the same overall dimension. And so this is why these double trace operators are degenerate because of these KK modes. And so in order to compute the one loop guy in the previous slide, we need the actual anomalous dimension squared. You know, we can't take the average guy and square it. That will give the wrong answer. And so this means that we have to unmix these degenerate um, double trace operators at tree level in order to compute the one loop double discontinuity and get the one loop answer. So to do this unmixing, the data you need is the four point function for general single trace operators P at uh, general SP field theory order, and then the 2, 2 PP guy at tree level. And that is sufficient to do the unmixing and thus give you the final answer. Um, and of course, this is up to possible contact terms, which will only affect low spin CFT data. But the key point from this slide is that you get a different one loop answer depending on what precise KK modes you have. But that's the, but that's the only thing that changes. You know, it's not like you have to know anything else about the Lagrangian or effective action. Like it's just which KK modes. That's how we're going to get a different answer for a sphere, a sphere Monty 2, and no compact factor at all. Um, so this algorithm has been done in all the max plus supersymmetric cases. So it was originally done in 4D, i.e. n equals 4 super mills, you could say, for the case of ADS5 cross S5 in this original paper, which this was generalized ADS5 cross S5 Monty 2 in a recent paper by me and these authors. Um, in this case, there's one contact term which appears at the one-loop supergravity order, and this contact term you could fix using localization to get a certain non-zero value. Um, and so you needed localization because this isn't fixed by, you know, the, by the general kinematic algorithm. The one-loop calculation was also done in 3D, 
uh, for the case of ADS4 cross S7 mod Z2, and then later in ADS4 cross S7 in this recent paper by me and these authors, um, this was a bit harder because there was a new contribution to the DD coming from all twist operators. Again, there was one contact term ambiguity. Again, you could fix it using localization now for the EVGM theory. In this case, the coefficient was actually zero, which has the interesting implication that perhaps because the bulk dimension is odd, this contact term just vanishes, although that, that's a conjecture. Um, in six dimensions, this was computed both for ADS4 cross, ADS7 crosses four, as well as ADS7 crosses four mod Z2 in this paper by me and these authors. Again, there's a, there's a contact term ambiguity. We don't have localization, so we don't know how to fix it, but maybe you could conjecture it should be zero because again, the bulk dimension is odd, just like in the ADS4. Um, so the, um, the new thing we computed in this recent paper with Fernando is we also did the one loop calculation now for the pure ADS case in all maxable cases, D equals three, four, six. Um, and now there's actually no contact term at this one loop supergravity order, you know, as shown in the previous slides, you know, just because based on dimensional analysis, you just, there is no contact term you could write down um, at one loop order. So the point of this slide is just to tell you that one loop data is known. And so we have everything we need in order to compare two numerics. Um, there are also people who did one loop for other correlators, but I'm just focusing on the stress tensor correlator. Okay, so let's move on from the perturbative one over C uh, computations up to one loop. And now let's talk about non-perturbative in C calculations that you can do numerically using the numerical bootstrap. And so these numerical bootstrap bounds can be computed for any maximally supersymmetric C of T as a function of C, because C enters kinematically. In particular, you can compute upper bounds on scaling dimensions of unprotected multiplets. And this, uh, you can also get both upper and lower bounds, i.e. islands, on OP coefficients of certain multiplets, as long as they're protected, separated from the continuum of long multiples. In some cases, you can only get lower bounds. And the important thing about the bootstrap is that these numerical bounds improve monotonically as a function of the truncation of the crossing equations, which will parameterize by capital lambda. So that's why these bounds are rigorous and they are always improving. Uh, which is one of the big advantages of the numerical bootstrap. So without further ado, let's just jump into these bounds, doing it for each case. So let's start with the 60 uh, CFT case, and let's first review the known theories. So all known theories are classified by the groups SUN, SO, 2N, and exceptional group EN, as constructed from uh, string theory. Um, so the SUN case is dual to M theory in 87 crosses 4, and the SO, 2N case is dual to M theory in 87 crosses 4 mod Z2. And we're not going to talk about the exceptional groups because they don't have a large end limit. Um, so in this case, we relate the Planck length to C as follows, where there's a factor if it's an orbifold. And uh, remember, you could also consider some exotic C of T, which is dual to pure ADS7 supergravity. Um, and this C of T is very weird because it's only light single trace operator would be the stress tensor multiplet itself. So it just wouldn't have any operators in other representations of the R symmetry, which are um, you know, light single traces. So it's very exotic, but you know, in principle, it could exist. You know, it, it doesn't contradict that. Um, so what are the kinematics uh, for the stress sensor in the 60 theory? So the non-trivial multiplets, the ones we care about, they are long multiplets, um, which are singlets under the R symmetry. And then there's two classes of protected multiplets uh, with scaling dimension fixed, but OP coefficient unfixed. Um, so we're going to compute upper bounds on these OP coefficients. Um, also, we can kinematically restrict to interacting theories because the free multiple appears explicitly. Um, and then we can also compute an upper bound uh, on the stress and B coefficient, i.e. a lower bound on C itself, which should hold for any interacting CFT. Um, so this just follows from kinematics. So again, we're not assuming anything about the theory except maximal supersymmetry. And so these are the bounds you get in this most general case. So this study was originally done uh, by Beam, Lemos, Roselli, and Van Rees in 2015. And the way we improved it in our recent paper is that we just went to we went to way, 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 way higher bootstrap precision, which is necessary because in six dimensions, it takes a really long time to converge. Um, so lambda equals 91 is an extraordinarily high number for people who do the bootstrap. And so in this plot, we're showing the entire range of C that's actually expected because the smallest value of C of any known theory is the A1 theory, i.e. SU2, and that's C equals 25. And so that's the right-hand side of the plot. The left-hand side of the plot is C equals infinity. And here we're showing bounds on certain CFT data. So like the left-hand plot, is a certain scaling dimension of an unprotected multiplet. The right-hand plot is a certain OP coefficient whose scaling dimension is fixed, but whose OP coefficient is unknown. And so in these plots, the black line is the numerical non-perturbative bound that we just get for any finite value of C. Uh, and then we're comparing it to these perturbative one over C analytic calculations. 
So first you have the tree level calculation, which is one over C, which is the straight line because we're comparing it to you know, one over C on the x-axis. And so as expected for super, super large C, the tree level correction saturates the bound, but um, as C becomes less than super large, it diverges from the bound because you know this is just the leading order correction. Now let's see how one loop improves tree level once we add in one over C squared. And so we give this improvement term for three cases, 87 crosses four, 87 crosses four mod C2, and pure supergravity 80 of seven. And so what you can see is that the 87 crosses four case is clearly no longer saturating the bound. It becomes within the allowed region. Whereas um, the mod Z2, as well as the pure supergravity case, I mean, they're, they're kind of hard to distinguish them by eye. They're so close to each other. Um, but it's clear that they are both much, much closer to saturating the bound. Um, so, I mean, it's clear, you can clearly see the distinction on the left-hand plot. The right-hand plot, it's a little bit harder to see. In that case, it just looks like everything is saturating the bound. Um, but you also know analytically that this pure uh, supergravity guy is above the other guys. And so that means if anything is saturating the bound from the bottom, it has to be the pure ADS. Um, and so, uh, so, so this is kind of the interesting result in the 6D context. Um, um, furthermore, I should add that in uh, Rosselli et al.'s original paper, they also computed a bound on C for any general interacting theory. And um, the bootstrap converges very slowly in 60. So they computed this bound as a function of this bootstrap parameter lambda. And they did an extrapolation shown here, which suggested that perhaps in the infinite precision limit, this general bound would actually be saturated by the A1 theory. Um, and so that would be very interesting if true. Um, personally, I'm agnostic about this claim simply because we don't know physically how this bound should scale with lambda. I mean, lambda is a very human parameter. And so it's not clear to me that it actually scales linearly, even at this large value of lambda. And so, I mean, who is to say it, the extrapolation would go to 26 instead of 25 or 24? But still, it's intriguing that it, get, it gets close to 25. And so this suggests that it's possible that maybe this A1 theory would correspond to these general bounds. Um, but certainly for any larger value of C, it seems clear that these AN theories cannot possibly be saturating the bound. Because remember, A, the AN theory is the purple, and that's just clearly not saturated. Uh, Shai, can I ask a yes. question? Sure. So, so you're, you're saying that pure supergravity in, 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 in seven dimensions is basically saturating the, the bound with lambda yes. equals 91, and it's incredibly hard to, to push this further. Do you think that if you were able to multiply lambda by 10 or something like that, we would be able to see if you know if it's still saturating or it could lie to one side. Oh, oh, okay, okay. So that's a great question. So lambda ninety one is big enough that you actually really see convergence. Um, so to convince you of that, I should show other values of lambda. But we checked that, like, if you compare lambda equals ninety one to eighty one seventy one, at this point it's it's converged. Uh, so okay, like, okay, yeah, yeah. So it wasn't converged at like thirty, you know, which is like what people originally did. Right. But like after we went to like much higher values, we finally got convergence. No, no, I, I understand. Yeah. I, com I completely trust yeah. that, for instance, 87 crosses 4 is within the allowed region. But yeah. since you're saying, for instance, that the line for 87 is exactly on top of the bound, that is intrinsically unstable, right? Like if you're telling me that the 87 line is on top of the numerical bound. Yeah. Or, or it, it, does it lie to one side or the other? It's just. Well, well I mean, you, I mean you, you can look at the plot yourself. I mean, as you see, this yellow line, I mean, first of all, it depends what regime of C you're looking at. So, like, yeah. for the very smallest value of C, where you might not expect one loop to be a good approximation, it's surprising yeah. it's even that close at all. Okay. So, like, yes. you only really expect to be able to do the comparison at large C. Okay, but, okay, okay. I mean, yeah, I mean, one reason you should trust the convergence of these bounds is that, I mean, look at the very large C regime. In that case, you know, tree level should be trustworthy. And that's exactly on the bound. And from the bootstrap perspective, convergence is pretty much the same for any value of C. Um, and so, I mean, this is another reason why you should trust these bounds are actually converging. So, so, so to be able to tell it wouldn't it wouldn't help to increase lambda a lot, you really need to go to Yeah, yeah. At this point, I don't think increasing okay, lambda would do anything. Got like, it. I mean, it would change it to like, you know, the 10th decimal place or something. But like, uh, uh, for, at least for the purpose of this comparison by I, I don't think that's necessary. I mean, for more fine-grained comparisons, of course, that's very important. But, you know, for this crude comparison, I don't think that would change anything. Uh, Sorry, I also wanted to ask regarding the, the higher loops. So how, I mean, when do you expect that the higher loop corrections can change these plots? Or oh, okay, okay. Or so, is there so, any yeah. expectation about whether they will change? So, so that is an excellent question. One? Yeah, it's an excellent question. And like, I don't know the answer. And that's why I think it's very important to compute these higher loop corrections, which, which you could certainly do. And I hope people will do. Um, my guess is that they will probably be small, considering that one loop already gets a pretty good match. On the other hand, though, this could well be an asymptotic expansion. And so it might be the case that like once you start going to like five loop order, maybe it'll actually make the, you know, the approximation worse. Um, you know, I mean, that's always kind of the game you're playing when using these asymptotic expansions. 
um, but yeah, no, there is no expectation about whether. Yeah, there's no expectation. Yeah, I mean, I don't think anybody knows. Up or low or below or like. Yeah, I don't even think people don't, people don't even know the sign of what these higher loop corrections mm -hmm. okay. look like. They can be positive, they can be negative. You know, um, it's hard. It's hard to say. Yeah, so it would be very nice to compute them. Um, that's kind of an open question. Should I? Yeah. J just to add on in the same spirit, for what values of c did you actually do your numerics? Um, so yeah, so we're showing an, the black line is an interpolation. We did, I think, something like thirty different values evenly dispersed from but in this range. What was the largest value? Uh, the largest, well, the largest value was infinity, um, no, and the smallest the value numbers, was right? sorry. Like, for the actual yeah, 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 yeah. you pick a number, yeah. right? So yeah, what yeah. Was the so, largest so, so, C you picked? so the largest C is infinity, um, because you, you can because one over C enters into the numerics, and so you can just literally make one over c zero so that's infinity um and then the smallest value of c is and then we did 30 values dispersed between uh, but we did enough values that we, we we trusted that the black line is a good interpolation that um we weren't missing out on any like little fluctuations uh and then we did even more values in the very large c regime um i forget i think we did like 10 cluster at very large mm, c. i see um because the the part of the line that we care about is really just the part close to the y-axis right yeah so well, yeah, there, yeah, that's it's, it's hard to tell that there's any difference at all. Um, indeed, in yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, the reason why I'm showing this full thing is because indeed it's very hard to tell in the very large C regime in 6D. Um, and you know, and so, but because you know, C is so large, it can be super, you know, you would need like incredibly precise numerics really to tell the difference. And that's why I'm trying to show a bigger range of C to kind of show a more compelling, you know, uh, story. Um, but you'll see like in the next couple slides when I do 3D and 4D, in that case, you can actually tell better in the large C regime. It's only in 60 that you really have to look at the full guy. Okay, we'll we'll talk again. Thanks. Yeah, great. Um, okay, so so let's move on to 4D now. So in 4D, the known uh, theories are super Yang mills with various uh, gauge groups, which can be any classical gauge group. And then it's a conformal manifold parameterized by this complexified coupling tau. So when the gauge group is SUN, this is um, type to be string theory and it is five crosses five. When it's SON or USB 2N, then it's the orbifold theory. Again, we can relate the string length to n by this dictionary with a slightly different parameter for orbifold or not. And then this, the complexified string coupling is just exactly this, the complexified gauge coupling. And then there's also an exotic CFT, which is just pure ADS5 supergravity, which is some unknown conformal manifold. And so, th so these are the CFTs we consider. Um, the kinematics in this case is actually much simpler than 6D. So for the stress tensor correlator, the only data which is non-trivial is the scaling dimensions of unprotected operators, because all the protected operators are just completely trivially fixed by this 2D chiral algebra. And so they're just one over C exact. They don't depend on the coupling. And so we don't care about them. Um, again, the free multiplet appears explicitly, so we can just kinematically restrict interacting CFTs. Although in this case, there's no interesting bootstrap bound on C because the kinematics basically just show you the lowest possible bound is three quarters, which happens to be the SU2 super Yang Mills theory. Uh, so the story is actually much cleaner in 4D than 6D. Um, and so again, let's show a bound on a certain CFT data, this, you know, the spin two guy um, at uh, large uh, C. So in this plot, we really are focusing on large C. We're not looking at the full range of C, which would go down to three quarters. We're just looking at large C so that, you know, as Eric says, we can really focus on comparing to one loop, which should be valid at large C. And here we actually see it uh, very clearly that ADS5 cross S5 and ADS5 cross S5 mod Z2 are not saturating the bound. They're just somewhere in the allowed region, uh, except that super large C where they're indistinguishable from tree level. Whereas the pure ADS5 correction is saturating the bound. In fact, for the entire range of large C that we're looking at here. And what's particularly remarkable about the saturation is that you see that the sign of the one loop correction for the pure guy is positive, whereas negative for the other guys. And so because tree level started becoming slightly lower than the bound, the only way you could have possibly gotten saturation was to have a positive one loop correction, which is only the case for pure ADS5. Um, and so I think in 4D, there's even stronger evidence that indeed it's the pure guy, which is saturating these bounds. Also, I should comment that, you know, the, these are conformal manifolds. So in principle, you know, there's some uh, dependence on the complexified coupling, but this one loop supergravity guy actually does not depend on the complexified coupling. So that also makes this comparison a bit cleaner. Um, okay, so uh, so this is the one bound we have in 4D. Uh, this is the most general bound. Can um, I ask about it? Sure. Sorry, thanks. So I'm struggling to understand the meaning of these lines at yeah. these order one values of C. For, yep. the, for the 
classical or semi-classical gravitational questions, yeah. you really want to stay near the y-axis. And there, things are on top of each other. Now, you're asking us to kind of extrapolate those down to finite C, where they start to split, and to take that split seriously. But strictly, yes. we shouldn't really do that. It's a matter of we, we need to somehow trust this expansion and take your word that it is an actual representation of a difference between these theories, even though you're staying near large C when you compute these lines. Well, OK. I mean, your question is basically like, can you use perturbative corrections? Like, you know, do perturbative calculations work non-perturbatively? And of course, like, there's no, you know, rigorous answer to that question. But in practice, they work pretty well. I mean, like, I don't know, when, when you, you know, do experiments on, you know, the icing model, you can do an epsilon expansion and it gives like a reasonable answer. You know, so to here, like we have this one over C perturbative expansion. The question is up to what finite value of C is it giving a good answer? I don't know, you know, rigorously. But, you know, based on looking at this plot, it seems pretty convincing that it works at least within this large C regime I'm looking at. I mean, because like, you know, indeed, you know, a very large C, you know, tree level is exactly on the bound, as you would expect. And then as C gets slightly smaller, you expect more one over C corrections to start mattering. And indeed, that's exactly what happens. So like, you know, it, it had to be the case at super large C that all the terms would be right on top of each other, because then they're all just tree level, which is the same. And so too, it had to be the case that as C gets slightly bigger, the three colors would start diverging. And that's exactly what happens. And the moment they start diverging, you see that pure supergravity is the guy on the non-perturbative vector. So yeah, I mean, I mean, this is this is how the story has to work. Now, like you can ask the question, okay, to what finite value of C should I trust these things? I don't know, but you know, it's for you guys to decide. And I think this shows pretty compelling evidence that at least for some fraction of this plot, it's probably trustworthy. Yeah, I mean, sometimes these extrapolations work. One generally needs to understand the problems on a case-by-case -case basis, but I'm just yeah. saying that, yeah, as we really stick near infinite C, where the lines really are pretty much on top of each other, that's where the questions about semi-classical gravity enter. And there, the plot doesn't seem to tell us much. Well, sure. OK, but you can also just take our data points and just do a fit yourself that we give a table in the paper. And indeed, you know, just by looking at the two smallest data points, so like, you know, 1 over C equals 0 and 1 over C equals like 0 0.001, you can like do a fit. And again, you can compare that fit to one loop. And, and indeed, you find that pure supergravity is matching to like three digits. Whereas the ADS5 process five and Monty two guys are not matching. Um, so if you so, zoom in, like yes. zoom in a lot to that one yes. intercept, you're saying there'd be some yes. tiny discernible difference, yes. but it's discernible. Yes, it is discernible, and we give a table in our paper. Yeah, um, maybe I should have included that that table in the uh, talk. I can actually, after I'm done with these slides, there's a little bit of extra time. I can just open up the paper and show you guys the table, um, uh, and so that will convince baby skeptics who really want to see the super large C limit. Um, okay. Thank you. Um, I'm focusing on the super large C limit just because that's the the gravitational regime in which you set up the the problem and, and framed sure, it. Right. Sure. Thanks. Um, I, any any other questions? Yes. Can I ask a quick question? Sure. So so you you draw eighty five versus five and eighty five versus five mod z two. Yeah. Uh, from the point of view of the calculations that you do, would it matter if I replace it by eighty five versus five mod z n? We, we, oh well, that, that that wouldn't have maximal supersymmetry. Um, that's, and so, that, that's right. That's right. Yeah. That, that, that is true. But but you know, at the at the level of the supergravity, you know, the, the consistent truncation you're using is still good. It's just that you know the causal client states are not supersymmetric and just some high. Some, some very well, high I mean, you, you you would just have to compare it to a different bootstrap study then. So like in that case, you had a forty n equal two supersymmetry, and then you would have to compute the bounds in that case, and you would get different bounds probably. They would probably be weaker. Okay. Um, so. Um, yeah, so I'm only showing results with maximal supersymmetry, and that's why I'm restricted to these three cases. Um, great. Um, so these are the most general bounds with no assumptions. What happens, though, if we improve the bounds by putting in assumptions specific to n equals 4 super A mills? So we can do that using localization, because we have explicit values as functions of both the coupling and n um, for the mass to form free energy. You can take derivatives related to this four-point function. This is what was done in these various papers with these authors. And so let me show, the, show you the resulting bounds once we input these localization inputs, say for the specific case n equals 2, although in principle we could do any value of that. Um, and so now in this plot, this gray dotted line is basically the, you know, the previous plot, except now specifically for the case n equals 2, which is c equals 3 quarters. And so this is the general bound, this gray dotted line. It's a horizontal line because it's not a function of ga mills. Because you know, for the general bound, we have no way of inputting the value of ga mills. Uh, now we see how the plot improves once you put in the localization value specifically for n equals four super A mills. That becomes this black line. Um, and what's exciting about this black line is that in the weak coupling regime, you expect you should be able to compare it to perturbative calculations. 
Um, and indeed, it compares quite well to perturbative calculations. So here you see here are perturbative calculations of the three loop, four loop, you know, four loop with the pad A. All of them match in this weak coupling regime. And indeed, they even seem to match all the way up to 0.4. So, you know, as Eric says, of course, rigorously, perturbative calculations should only work, you know, perhaps you would only expect them to work right at the corner, right, 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 near zero. And yet, in this case, where we like completely know we coupling expansion and we completely know the non-perturbative bounds, we see that magically they seem to work all the way up to point four. You know, so this should really, you know, show you that there are indeed cases where perturbative calculations work deep into the non-perturbative regime, um, which is miraculous, but, you know, sometimes nature is kind to us. Um, and so another important fact about these bounds I want to show, so these bounds are very well converged. So they're not going to change as we improve the bootstrap precision. And yet we see that for the entire range of g -ing mills that we see, the old bounds, which were very general, are just excluded. And so that means it is impossible that these old bounds could have possibly have been corresponding to n equals force degree -ing mills, because for every value of the coupling, they are excluded. And so this should give, this just shows further evidence. So not only at large n do we see that a D is five crosses five is not corresponding to the most general bounds. Now we also see at small n that it is not corresponding to the most general bounds, um, which is another kind of fun result um, from these uh, numerics. Okay, so, so that concludes the 4D discussion. Um, so moving on to 3D. So in this case, all known theories are these churn time as matter theories with two gauge groups parameterized by churn summons level K, uh, N, and then you can have a different gauge group for the second guy. And we're going to focus on the maximally supersymmetric case, in which case this churn time is level and the shift have to be one or two. Otherwise, you would have slightly less supersymmetric. So in this case, um, uh, you can have two possible duals. So if n is large and k is finite, then you have n theory and 80 score across the seven mod ck, where you have max supersymmetry when k is one or two um, uh, with this dictionary. And then there's another context where both k and n are large. And then you have type A on 80 score across CP3, but that does not have maximal supersymmetry. And so we're not going to focus on that to the same extent. Similarly, there's yet a third limit where one of the gauge groups is large and K is large. Then you have a higher spin gravity regime. But again, that does not have maximal supersymmetry. And so we do not expect it to appear in our plots. And then finally, we, you can consider this exotic CFT, which is just pure ADS4 supergraph. Um, so basically, it's going to be M theory or ADS4 supergraph. Sorry, can I ask you a question yes. about this? Sure. Uh, differently from the other theories now in four dimensions, uh, yeah. uh, pure maximal supergravity is not unique. You have an infinite number of theories that have uh, n equals a supergravity with SO8 gauge group uh, and all the interactions and maximal supersymmetric vacuum. So, well, uh, okay. So, I should... anywhere yeah. is there any obvious reason why only one is the relevant one? Or... Well, okay. So, okay. So, let me make a couple comments. First of all, I'm talking about. Um... Uh, so I need to be careful, like how I define pure ADS for supergravity. I'm just defining pure ADS supergravity as just a theory, uh, which you know does not have any light single trace operators other than the graviton, and you know at leading order is Einstein gravity. So th that's my definition. Now, like there could be multiple such theories because that's a very general definition. So it's like you know, for such a theory, it's a it's an effective theory. You have high derivative corrections with you know certain coefficients. You want to fix them. Maybe there are actually multiple ways of fixing them. As you say, that could well be the case in 40. That could also be the case in 60 or 70, for all I know. Um, so I'm just being agnostic. I'm just saying there, like there is a theory you could construct which doesn't have these light single trace operators. Perhaps there's multiple, um, um, as you are saying. Well, well, the question would be whether all of these are realizable or not. Somehow, you no. Know, the, the the problem we have is that we have all these theories in four dimensions, yeah. which we don't have in other dimensions. Yeah, we have only one theory that seems to be upliftable to M theory, and the others are not somehow, or at least we don't know yet. And so I was curious whether there was a possibility to see this somehow here. So, 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 and I'm just saying that, like, the way I define purity through through four supergravity, the only rule is that you don't have higher KK modes. So the guy that's dual to M theory clearly is not purity as four supergravity because that does have higher KK modes. But if, as you are telling me, if indeed there are many different ways of writing down ADS for supergravity with higher derivative corrections with no other KK modes, then from my perspective, I wouldn't be able to distinguish them. And then indeed, it would be a fascinating question to use other tools to try to distinguish them. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Yes, but that, that, that's a good point. Yeah, that, that indeed, like, you know, maybe there's even multiple pure supergravities which you could define non-derivative. Um, anyways, so in this case, um, the non-trivial multiplets of the four-point function, you have long multiplets. Um, just as in other dimensions. Um, and you now have some uh, protected multiplets whose OP coefficients are unfixed. 
and those we can also get bounds on. In this case, we can actually get both upper and lower bounds because they're separated from the continuum. So it's, it's a bit more powerful than higher dimension. Um, on the other hand, in 3D, the free multiplet is next to the continuum of longs, and so you can't just kinematically kill the free theory, unlike 4D and 6D. So that's a certain drawback uh, to the most general bootstrap study you would want to do. Um, so let's show the results for certain um, CFT data. Uh, so as usual, we're looking at the large C regime. That's why the x-axis goes up to 0.14. You know, we're parameterizing it by 16 over C. The reason why we put a 16 is just because convention that like the free theory is 16 in, the, in this definition of C. So we're looking at the large C regime. So as usual, we expect that at super large C, i.e. say at like 0 0.01, tree level should be saturating and things should be indistinguishable as indeed they are. And then as C becomes less than super small, you should start seeing a difference as in every other case. And indeed, we find that uh, once you include the one loop correction, once it's noticeable, you start seeing that the one loop correction of the pure guy is saturating the bound, where for the non-pure guys, it's not saturating the bound. Um, and so what's nice about this plot is that you can see kind of like what you expect to see, which is that as C becomes finite, you know, the one loop correction is not a good approximation anymore. And so like, you know, these analytic curves are basically random. You know, so the fact that this yellow line is all the way up here, who cares? And when C is super, super tiny, then you can't tell the difference between tree level and anything else. And so you want to be looking at some intermediate regime. Of course, as Eric has emphasized, we don't have any rigorous understanding of an intermediate regime, but, th but there has to be one. And so like based on looking at this plot, I would conjecture that intermediate regime is maybe somewhere up to like, you know, 0 0.02, 0 0.03. And there you noticeably see that pure supergravity saturating the bound, tree level slightly below, and these uh, 80 square across seven and mod Z2 are all the way below. And it's the exact same pattern for the scaling dimension as it is for the OPE coefficient. Um, and indeed for the other CFT data we looked at as well. You know, and so one thing which should convince you is that if I had just found these things for like maybe one CFT data, you might be skeptical. But we find this for like every CFT data we looked at, you know, so, so clearly something is going on here. You know, we're not just getting lucky, you know, with one thing. Um, okay, so these are bounds, most general sorry, bounds. One, sorry to interrupt, yes. one question. So just to understand, why, can you repeat again? So it seems to me that you are kind of identifying the re, this intermediate regime in which yes. one loop approximation should be valid. Yeah. The regime in which you saturate the bound with yeah. your ADS, but I don't, Fully understand the, the intuition behind that. Why why you, it should be that you trust the computation when you try to rate the bound? Well, I mean, not before, it, why I mean, not after? It, it, what is it, the... It's just a statement that, like, if you have, okay, say you're trying to compute a function f of x, say you do a Taylor series, one plus x plus x squared. So, you know, that Taylor series should be a good approximation to f of x for some range of x. Now, like, to prove that rigorously, you know, you would need to have a full understanding of the function f of x, which we don't have. Um, and like there are certain exotic functions f of x where the perturbative expansion might be horrible, you know, and maybe it, it doesn't work for any value of x. But for most reasonable functions f of x, perturbative expansion one plus s plus x squared, you know, will work for some regime of x, you know, maybe x up to five or something like that. So that's all I'm saying. Yeah, but why 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 you trust it when you saturate the bound? I mean, why you identify that regime? I agree there should be some regime that you trust. Yeah. But why that regime you identify with the region of the plot in which you saturate the bound with pure radius? Oh, 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 why no. I you mean, don't make it larger or smaller or well, I mean I mean you you could. I mean, look, you know, if, if you look at even larger C, you see that it continues to saturate. I mean, the reason why I'm looking at an intermediate value of C is simply that for very large C, if I showed you a plot by I, you wouldn't be able to tell the difference. You know, because like these one loop corrections, one over C squared, if I showed you the plot from one over C equals zero to one over C equals 10 to the minus 50, you know, then you would need a mic you know, microscope in order to see the difference between this correction. And so it's just for the human eye that I'm showing you a regime where you can kind of tell the difference. Okay, but um, it could happen both ways. Like it could happen that if I see this plot, I could think that maybe the moment in which they start splitting is when you cannot trust the regime, so I cannot say anything. Or it could also happen the other way around. Maybe I could say, oh no, I can't trust everything until 0 0.1. So I can already see that with one loop, pure ADS is not allowed. Yeah, yeah, but I would say like the reason you should trust it is that, you know, it saturates the bound, right? I mean, like that's a very non-trivial thing. Like that doesn't happen randomly. Like, uh, you know, it's like- Okay, so that's the point. So you think that it's, it's yeah. So you find yeah. there's a motivation that saturates the bound. Because yeah, exactly. Yeah, I mean, like, like this is what's supposed to be convincing you. It's like, you know, if I had told you before we did this study that like, oh, I'm going to compute a bunch of perturbative expansions. I expect one of them to saturate the bound. There would be no reason for me to say that, and you, and you should have been very skeptical. And so it's extremely surprising when you find that some perturbative expansion, you know, in the perturbative regime of a non-perturbative thing, starts saturating the bound because they didn't have to happen. Um, you know, like I mean, like like that's what's exciting about this. 
Um, and so, and like that should then motivate you to be like, okay, now I can conjecture that this is probably the regime where the one loop mm -hmm. correction is like a good approximation, you know, like okay, even though of course a priori you have no way of proving. Um, okay. you know, but, but, but this is just always a question whenever comparing non-perturbative stuff. Okay, okay. okay good, just yeah. understand what, what you have in mind. Good, yeah. thank you. Uh, great. Um, okay, so. Yeah. I yeah. mean, it would be, as we're saying, these plots are suggestive. Do you think there's any chance of getting some understanding of the asymptotics of the 1 over C expansion so you could try to justify the point beyond which one should not trust a line like this? I, I think it's an excellent question. And I, I honestly don't know. I mean, like, maybe. I mean, like, you know, yeah. I think it's a fascinating question to look into. Like, you know, can you get some general conceptual understanding of like, is it a convergent expansion? You know, what, what, like, what, what, how do the non-perturbative correction scale, et cetera? And that would give you some extra motivation. Yeah, so I think that's a great thing to look into, but I don't have an answer. Um, okay, so in my remaining few minutes, uh, let me talk about what happens when you put in localization. So now specifying to a specific theory. So let's look at a bound on a certain OP coefficient, which we actually know how to compute using localization. So this is an old bound from a plot from a paper from several years ago. And so um, the black solid line is the bootstrap bound, the dotted line is with lower precision. Uh, and then these colored lines is like an exact value known from localization for various n equals eight theories. Um, and so this plot has a lot of information, but let's just the, the important point to focus on is that this bootstrap bound is going to zero at the certain value, which is around like 0.7, a little bit higher. Whereas the localization values which are exact approximately, are, are going to zero at a different point. And so it seems like at finite C, there is a difference between the most general bound, which is black, and the exactly known localization value. Um, and so when we originally you know, made this plot several years ago, maybe we would have thought that, okay, as you improve the bootstrap precision, maybe this black solid line will move a little bit to the right, and then it will like become exactly the same as this exact localization value. Um, whose lowest point corresponds to the lowest known interacting ABGM theory. Unfortunately, or maybe fortunately, that's not what happens. Because later on, we did a mixed correlator bootstrap study. And then mixed correlator bootstrap study, we uh, so this mixed correlator bootstrap study just automatically excludes um, this lowest interacting theory just on kinematic grounds. Uh, and yet, nonetheless, the mixed correlator bootstrap study showed that there is a kink, which is exactly corresponding to where this black line is going to zero. And we did it at much higher bootstrap precision. So like it's pretty well converged. And so basically the point I'm trying to tell you is that this, where the black line goes to zero, that's not going to change. Um, and it has nothing to do with the lowest interacting theory because that can't even possibly appear in this bound. And so this shows that at finite C, just as we saw in 4D at finite C, that the most general bound couldn't possibly correspond to the physical theory and equals force spring mills. So to in 3D, we see that the most general bound given by this black line can't possibly correspond to ABGM theory, which is the red line. And so there's kind of a uh, you know, pattern both in 3D and 4D. Um, the last plot I'll show you before I finish up is let's look at the large C regime. And now let's put in this localization value. Um, and so again, this plot has a lot of information. I apologize, but let me just try to briefly tell you what's going on. So let's focus on the black line um, so the black line is both an upper and lower bound. The lower one is the lower bound once we put in the localization value. So this should apply to ABJM with k equals two. The gray line was just the most general bound before we put in the localization value. So it's a little bit hard to distinguish by eye, but if you look carefully, you can see the gray line is a bit weaker than the black line as expected. And you can see that this you know, one loop correction for the ABJM theory um, is closer to the black line than it is to the gray line. Um, and so, you know, this gives some hope that after inputting the value of localization, there's a chance that now these numerical bootstrap results are actually corresponding to the physical ABGM theory. And thus you could maybe use them, you know, in the future with greater precision to try to like, you know, do a fit and read off higher derivative corrections. But of course, this is at a very early stage. You know, I'm certainly not claiming we can do that yet. Um, anyway, so, so to conclude, because um, I guess I'm right at the one hour mark. Uh, we showed that the large C expansion of holographic correlators is fixed by the analytic bootstrap in terms of a few coefficients um, in general. Uh, and then general bootstrap bounds for maximally supersymmetric theories are saturated by pure ADS at a very large C regime, uh, where it's up to you to decide what you consider large C, and not string M theory. Uh, and intriguingly, even at finite C, we observe certain bootstrap features that suggest that also the string M theory CFTs can't be covered, um, saturating the bound i.e. we observed in 4D and 3D by comparing two exact results that they're just not saturating the most general bound. Um, 
we could then input theory specific quantities like localization to improve the bounds in D equals three and four. And then we find some evidence that they are saturated by string and M theory. Um, uh, and then finally, um, we can read off from the numerics in principle to get higher derivative corrections. And so far we have some progress in 3D where it seems like we can approximately get one loop in ABGM theory from this localization improved bootstrap. But you know, this is very much a work in progress. Um, so there's many future directions. First of all, ideally, we would like to improve that work in progress to get super precise numerics such that we could then just read off the due date R to the four correction, you know, which would allow you to kind of, you know, understand the string and M theory effective action in principle to any order. Um, and so to do this, we need greater precision, more localization inputs, et cetera. Um, also, the best results so far have been in 3D and 4D uh, because, you know, there we have localization to put in. Uh, in the 60 case, if you want to input some known quantities about the 62 comma zero theory, you would have to look at not the stress tensor correlator, but this other correlator, 3333, because in that case, Eric and I showed back in 2018 that there's a certain OP coefficient, which you can non-trivially compute using the 2D Carl algebra, and then you could input it and then hopefully restrict to that theory and get some nice results. Um, also, as people commented, it would be great to understand more about this one over C expansion in the pure ADS case. So to compute two loops, three loops, and see if this like continues to saturate the bound, this would be more confidence that indeed we're allowed to look at this intermediate regime, because of course, you know, that's conjectural. Also, as Eric mentioned, it would be great to learn about the asymptotics at large C just conceptually to get a better understanding of what regime things should be saturating. Um, um, finally, in the specific case of 3D, um, once you go to less than maximal supersymmetry, i.e. n equals six, then we observed in this paper from a couple of years ago, that the most general bounds are now saturated by higher spin gravity, which corresponds to this ABJ theory where uh, basically the turn time is level and the gauge group is going to infinity. And so it's curious that it's like a vector type model, which is saturating the bound, the moment supersymmetry becomes small enough that you can see a vector type model, because you couldn't see that for maximal supersymmetry. And so this kind of suggests a certain intuition that like bootstrap bounds want to be saturated by vector models when they can. Because of course, also we know that with zero supersymmetry, the ON model, you know, saturates the bounds. You know, it's shown by Slava and David, et cetera. Um, so 3D, it's probably vector models. In 4D though, we know that there are no interacting vector models. And so this suggests the possibility that even the non-supersymmetric stress sensor bootstrap in 4D could be saturated by pure ADS gravity with no supersymmetry simply because there is no other candidate gravity type theory which would saturate those bounds. And so this is something that we would like to look into in the future.